brought me out to golden day. He placed me upon a strong rock by his side. My steps were established and here I'll abide. No danger of falling while here I remain. I'll stand by his grace until the crown I gain. He brought me out of the miry clay. He set my feet on the rock to stay. He puts a song in my soul today. A song of praise, hallelujah. He gave me a song, t'was a new song of praise. By day and by night, its sweet notes I will raise. My heart's overflowing, I'm happy and free. I'll praise my Redeemer who has rescued me. He brought me out of the miry clay. He set my feet on the rock to stay. He puts a song in my soul today, a song of praise, hallelujah. I'll sing of his wonderful mercy to me, I'll praise him till all men his goodness shall see. I'll sing of salvation and hope and of God, till many shall hear the truth and trust in God. He brought me out of the fiery clay. He set my feet on the rock to stay. He puts a song in my soul today, a song of praise, hallelujah. He brought me out of the fiery clay. He set my feet on the rock to stay. He puts a song in my soul today, a song of praise, hallelujah. Good morning, Geneva College. Thank you, thank you. My, my favorite thing uh, about chapel is getting to walk in and have at least 10 people swarm me and say, can you announce this, can you announce that, can you announce this? And I never remember all the things, so God forgive me. It's good to be together today. Reminder that Wellness Wednesday is today, 3.30 to 5.30. There are campus leadership positions available for all of you in the CSC and in campus ministry. So if you're interested in any sort of leadership on campus, please, there are beautiful posters all over with QR codes, which we all love. So take a picture of that, um, or you can go to My Geneva and apply there. Uh, so if you're interested in any of those positions, please go sign up. There will be an info session today at 4 o'clock in the CSE, or on Friday at the 1010 10 hour. City House is open for application, so if you want to get a, a wonderful communal living experience, please think about doing that. I, I honestly look at Carissa all the time, who is the, the leader of City House, and I said, if I would have been in college at Geneva, I would have 100% done that. So live my life through you and go sign up for City House. The career fair is this coming Tuesday, so in less than a week, this whole room will be packed with future employers for all of you to go check out. So if you're a freshman, a sophomore, any, anything, you don't have to be a senior to go to that. You should go check it out and uh, let them know that I sent you so that I can win a bunch of prizes. There's a volleyball game in this building tonight at 7 p.m. Let's go, boys. Let's do something tonight. Yeah? Yeah! Wow, volleyball fans in the building. We'd love to see it. Human vs. Zombies is coming, coming up, so you should go, go sign up, up for that. that. There's, There's going to be a great, great video coming out to advertise for that. I'm excited about that. And, and then, then finally, there is a worship, worship night this Friday in John White Chapel at 7 o'clock. Um, there will be posters coming up soon, but you should go to that. It's going to be an awesome night of worship and celebration. Um, I, I know I usually hold up my phone and tell you guys to 
as everybody says, get off the gritty, or if it's just me, I don't know. Uh, but today, I was going to hold up something else that I found in my backyard. For those of you who don't know, I live right next to Geneva Young and Arms, and my backyard is this big because there's a parking lot in it. And uh, when I got home from Jubilee, which was amazing, and I found a singular shoe in my backyard. It is a black size 13 male shoe. So if you are missing a shoe, it's in my office in Sky Lounge, so please come get it. This is not an encouragement now to other people to throw shoes in my yard, just, just so we're aware. All right. If you would, please join me in a moment of silence as we become aware of the Spirit's presence in this place. God, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for all that you do every day to remind us of your goodness to us. May you help us this morning be reminded of how good you are. And God, that our relationship with you isn't just based on what you do for us or what you can provide, but just on your character. May we desire to draw near to you today for nothing else other than who you are. God, continue to sustain us as we move into spring break where we pray you will give us rest and energy to finish the race faithfully. God, be with us this morning. Bless the words that will be brought to us. And be praised, Lord. Pray these things in your holy name. Good morning. In Psalm 67, the writer leads, leads us to call on God, to bless us, and to show us mercy, to set things straight by judging evil, and bring us prosperity. In the first verse, it captures the most remarkable image, asking that God would shine upon us the brightness of his face. How amazing that God would look at us with a beaming smile, full of love and grace and generosity. Imagine that we might actually see God's face. Wow. Now, if that happened, wouldn't you just want to praise God and, and tell everyone about the glory of God's face? Let's stand and sing. Psalm 67 together, because that's what Psalm 67 is really about. Oh God,
Good morning. We are the upper room, room. Um, so yes. <laughs> um, please read the Nicene Creed with me. Christians, what do you believe? We believe in one God, Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, of all things. with me John 1 1 through 9 in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the, God, and the, and the world was God he in the beginning was God in him was life the life was the light of man the light shines in the darkness and the darkness shall not overcome he came as a witness to bear witness to about the light that all might believe through him. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. Thanks be to God. Let's open, open with a prayer and just go before our, our God and enjoy his presence. I'd like, like to start with, with a, um, a, a verse I got from Paul, which is, I think, a prayer of his. Lord, I want you to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his suffering, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained this, or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Lord, help us to see you clearly, as Paul did. I fear that our culture and our nature, nation, which was uniquely set up as one nation under God, is losing its way. I fear that churches are often afraid to stand up for your righteous ways. We fail to acknowledge our sin for which Jesus died, wanting instead to be inclusive and embracing the sinful nature of man. Lord, many of your churches have been torn asunder, yet you are in control, and always there will be a remnant that follows you. Bless this campus. Help us to keep our eyes firmly fixed on you, that we too might attain to the resurrection from the dead. Let's pray together the Lord's Prayer. Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass in us. Give us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thy is the kingdom, and the power.
Who wants to be anonymous? Unknown, unseen, no one. We all want to have friends, people who care, who like us, who know us well. This is what we all want. And actually it's God who is that person for every one of you, the person who knows you, who loves you, who cares for you. In Psalm 56, we learn that God knows our path. Hicks Hicks told us last week that God God even knows all of our tears and collects them. Psalm 56 says that God is for me. We thank him because he saves us. He keeps us from stumbling. And with his face turned toward us, we can walk in the light of his presence. Let's stand and sing Psalm 56. In the waiting, in the searching, in the healing, in the hurting, like a blessing buried in the broken pieces. Every minute, every moment, where I've been and where I'm going, even when I didn't know or couldn't see it, there was Jesus. Inspiration for what to share from my testimony came as these lyrics from Zach Williams and Dolly Parton's song slapped me in the face on Monday evening. I shouldn't have been surprised. God has always spoken to me through song. From the church lady singing Jesus Loves Me and Go Tell It on the Mountain to Me in nursery school, to pouring out my heart singing Lord I Lift Your Name on High on summer mission trips in youth group at high school. My church experience is what one would call ordinary. I could really put to point to many moments where I knew Jesus and he really came to me and I came to know more about him. But my testimony doesn't come from a monumental moment in church, but from many moments of God reminding me, hey Lindsay, I'm still here. Look at, looking back at every moment, I know there was Jesus. Cancer. The Lord knows it's my least favorite word. But every time it appeared in my family's life, there was Jesus. My dad was given six months to a year to live when I was nine years old. He was diagnosed with a rare cancer. Why would this happen to our young family? Why would he be put through this? The battle wasn't easy. My dad got very sick. He lost a lot of weight, missed a lot of work. My brother and I were young. We were in fourth and fifth grade. We cried in school. I remember kids making fun of us. 
I remember hours spent in the hospital waiting room. I remember the fact that chicken noodle soup made my dad sick. I still can't eat it to this day. I remember my mom wondering if she was going to be a widow at the age of 33. My dad said, we're not going to let this change our family. We're going to pray and we're going to fight. And that's what we did. And through it all, there was Jesus. At 14 years old, my dad was diagnosed, when I was 14 years old, my dad was diagnosed with cancer a second time. Yep, you're, he beat that first cancer and a second time was diagnosed. Surely God was joking this time, right? The same guy who just proved he was one of your toughest fighters, the guy who had lost his own father to cancer just a year prior. At this point, I'm in ninth grade. I'm dealing with high school friend drama. I'm trying out for the cheerleading team. All I can think about is, why is God doing this to us? This time brought radiation for my dad, hair loss. My brother shaved his head in support of him. Don't look at me. I just mentioned I was trying out for the cheerleading squad. Um, but this truly rocked our community. Uh, everyone loved my dad. People... People poured, People poured out by the masses, masses and prayed for him. him. The, the last thing I wanted to do, though, was go to church and talk about it. But people would stop me on the street, people I didn't know. They would say, we're praying for your dad. We're talking about your dad in church. God's with your dad. He's here. I was in shock. I was in awe. Okay, God, I hear you. You're here again. I'm trusting you. My dad, my dad beat cancer, cancer again. again. For a man who never thought he'd see his kids graduate high school, he has seen so much more, because in those moments, there was Jesus. In 2012, my dad threw blood, clot, blood clots to his lungs, saddlebags like a horse over the top of his lungs. He spent over 20 days in the hospital, in and out of the ICU. I was newly married. My brother and his wife lived in Texas. And, and I needed to offer my mom a new kind of support, one that an adult child needed to offer. I didn't know what that looked like. It wasn't cancer this time, but something new and scary for our family. We were broken. How much more could one man's body truly handle? But in the mess of the hospital, amongst the wires, the tubes, the beeping machines, holding us up when we didn't know the words to pray, there was Jesus. My dad pulled through again. Fast forward to 2014. My husband and I have a toddler and we're learning and we learn we're expecting our second child. Most certainly overcome with joy, we planned for Brooklyn to announce our pregnancy to her grandparents. But our plans were halted and the world seemed to stop spinning when I began to miscarry at home alone with Brooklyn. It was early in the pregnancy and I still have more questions than I do answers. Brooklyn, at not even two years old, got my phone for me so, so I could call, call my husband or my mom. mom. I still to this day am not really sure who I called. I grieved. I felt alone. I couldn't have imagined why this would happen. The doctors had no answers. They said it's early. Try again after your next cycle. Six months later, I had a second miscarriage. Broken doesn't begin to describe where I was. I remember clinging to Brooklyn, singing Silent Night, rocking her to sleep, wondering why would God have this plan for me. I questioned him. I fought him. I fought him hard. I challenged every answer that he seemed to point me to. Those weren't good enough. Those didn't make sense. But through it all, in my darkest hours, there was Jesus. His answers were right. I did need to trust him, because we happily welcomed Penelope into our family in 2016. As she came during the perfect season of life for our family, my dad, yep, the stalwart of positivity and strength, had been diagnosed with a third, completely different cancer. You begin to have a sense of humor about it all, because along with your faith, laughter does help a little. Seeing my dad through his third battle with cancer was different. I was a parent myself. I now question, what would I do if I was in his shoes? How would I react? I would like to say I'd be as positive as he was, but I do know that through it all, there would be Jesus. Since this fall, I've been having some of my own health issues, and I still have certain days where I'm not operating at full capacity. 
when you sit in a waiting room waiting on test results from a doctor, so much flashes before your eyes. I think back to all the times my dad had been in those waiting rooms. What must have been going through his head? I certainly realized I wasn't carrying the same strength as him. My anxiety came on quick and it came on fast. I was only about nine months into my job here at Geneva and nervous about what taking time off would look like. My brain capacity and function at the end of October this fall was truly only at about three to five percent. Leaving the couch for a few days was nearly impossible, so working was completely out of the question. Fortunately, this Geneva community is made up of people like Willem, like Dean Swank, like President Trout and Andrea, like my full marketing team. I was comforted in prayer. I was talked to peer to peer about how to handle the situation. Stress seemed to lift off my shoulders. Sure, the worries remain, and I still have rough days. But I'm grateful for my journey. I'm blessed to be at Geneva. I'm thankful my dad is still alive. And I'm always reassured that there is Jesus. Maybe we, we should just say amen, amen and have a benediction, benediction after that, that wonderful testimony. testimony. It's indeed a pleasure for me to introduce uh, here our visiting chapel preacher, Dr. Andreas Kostenberger. Dr. Kostenberger is a widely respected New Testament scholar with numerous books and articles to his resume. He's also our speaker tonight for the J.G. Voss Memorial Lecture in Biblical Theology, which is at 7 p.m. in Sky Lounge. Please come and hear him speak tonight on the topic of a biblical theology of gender. Dr. Kostenberger's wife, Marnie, is also here uh, with him, and we're happy to have her along here today as well. Let's give a hearty Geneva College welcome to Dr. Andreas Kostenberger. Thank you, and uh, good morning. Uh, it's my privilege today to, uh, to join you here at Geneva College and to share with you briefly uh, some thoughts on John chapter 8, verse 12 in a moment. Uh, but first, uh, like uh, Lindsay a minute ago, I was asked to tell you a little bit about my own story and journey of faith, which is very different. As you listen, I hope uh, you catch a glimpse of, of God's incredible grace in our lives and, and Jesus' love for sinners. I was born in uh, Vienna, Austria, and grew up a nominal Roman Catholic. But uh, when I was in college back in Vienna, I became an existentialist. I resonated with those French thinkers who said that if there's no God, we're thrown into a meaningless existence, and it's, it's up to us to create some purpose for our lives, uh, even though ultimately, of course, life uh, has no transcendent meaning. I really liked their uh, intellectual radicalism because I felt that being religious simply because of tradition was pointless. Yet I also started to realize that in the end, existentialists were inconsistent themselves because if life has no meaning, why bother writing plays and, and try to convince others that life is meaningless? So I love plays like Waiting for Godot by Samuel Beckett, which is about a guy who keeps waiting for a friend named Godot, obvious reference to God, uh, who never shows up. The message is obvious. There is no God. Then one day, uh, while I was still in college, I decided to board a train uh, to travel to Venice, Italy uh, for the weekend. If you've ever been to Venice or even seen pictures, you know it's, it's a beautiful city, uh, well worth seeing. But God had other things in store for me on that trip. On the train, I met an American opera student who told me about her faith in Christ and and read some verses of scripture uh, to me from the book of Galatians. She started with uh, chapter 5, verse 1, which says, 
For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and don't submit again to a yoke of slavery. That resonated with me because more than anything, I, I wanted to be free. But then she followed that up with verse 13, which says, Only don't use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. But what, what, what made, made the most abiding impact on me and, and awakened me a deep longing was uh, uh, verse 22 and verse 23, the passage uh, about, about the fruit of the Spirit. Of the spirit. But, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, uh, peace, and so forth. Many of you know the passage. I was longing for those things, but if I was honest, at that time my life was rather marked by brokenness and pain. I was still reeling from my parents' divorce, and the band I'd been playing in ever since I was a freshman in college had recently split. Even though I'd grown up in a nominally religious country, I'd never read the Bible before. I was about 23 years old at that time. Uh, but when I heard those verses, it was as if uh, they spoke truth directly to me. So I decided that uh, what this student told me about Christianity was true, not only was I not a Christian, but neither were my parents, my sister, or uh, pretty much everybody I knew. So when I got back to Vienna, I bought an English Bible. Now, my first language is German, so there, there was a certain fresh feel to reading the scriptures in, in another language. Uh, and I read through the Bible cover to cover twice in the period of about six months. Uh, gradually, the Spirit of God was doing His work uh, in my heart, and after I struggled for some time with the idea that I was a sinner in need of a Savior, uh, and trying to figure out what it meant to have a personal relationship with God in Christ, uh, I gave my life to Christ and trusted in Him alone uh, for salvation. Now, after I'd become a Christian, I remember telling my Catholic mother that salvation was by grace. And, and they, that, that, that there was, was nothing I had to do to be saved. Be saved. Uh, it was simply a gift of God. But she said, no, Andreas, it, it can't be that simple. There are things we have to do. I also shared my newfound faith with virtually all my friends. I was so excited, but very few listened. In fact, one of my friends by the name of Peter told me, Andreas, actually, I'm really sorry for you. You're telling me you, you found the truth, but the adventure is in the journey. Uh, you need to always keep looking without ever arriving and settling for anything you firmly believe. Uh, kind of like that old U2 song, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. But I was not going to look back. As far as I was concerned, God's call on my life was not only a call to salvation, but also a call to ministry. So over the next few months, I sold an apartment I had inherited from my grandfather, packed my bag, said my goodbyes, and came to this country to go to seminary in Columbia, South Carolina. There I met my precious wife, Marnie. She's here with us this morning. And after earning my PhD in New Testament at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School in Chicago, I've taught New Testament for the past 30 years or so at, at various schools. You could say that my God-given passion is teaching others to study God's Word accurately in the original language as if possible uh, using proper principles of interpretation. So I, I teach classes and I've, I've written books on subjects like New Testament Greek, uh, hermeneutics, how to study the Bible, uh, John's Gospel, and Biblical Theology. In fact, my newest book, Biblical Theology, is about to come out it covers all 66 books of the Bible, uh, and it's the culmination of 30 years of research and writing. And my wife and I have uh, four grown children, two girls and two boys, who spread their wings and live in places like New York City, Southern Florida, Charlotte, and Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Go Heels. Uh, this morning, it's my privilege to lead us in a brief study of John 8. So in the next few minutes, I'd like us to focus on just one verse in John chapter 8, verse 12, which contains Jesus' bold claim of being light of the world. 
I want you to think of this not so much as a sermon as a devotional. You know, it's kind of interesting that in our text, Jesus makes this amazing statement that should definitely have elicited a response from his audience. But the Pharisees, the religious rulers, completely ignore it and instead attack his credibility. Rather than interact with Jesus on what he said, they object that he's testifying regarding himself and that such a self-witness is invalid. Later, they even go on to question his paternity. He claims to have got it as, as his father, but they uh, object that he's an illegitimate child and things go downhill from there. Uh, now, earlier in John's Gospel, as you may recall in chapter 6, when Jesus claimed to be the bread of life, he went on for about 20 verses to elaborate on that claim. But here, the Pharisees totally ignore him, and so the conversation takes an entirely different turn. But what I'd like us to do this morning is to do better than the Pharisees. I want us to pause and ponder the question, what does it mean that Jesus is the light of the world? After all, Jesus' claim is true. He is the light of the world. And we'll do well to dig deeper so that we truly understand not only what Jesus' statement means, but what it means for us. So let's read verse 12, reading from the ESV. Again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. All you have to do is listen to the news and you'll see that the world is mostly a dark place. Often I find that virtually all the news coverage is negative. Scandals, crimes, political gridlock, and so forth. It's true, often news outlets end up with some sort of a feel-good story about a lost puppy that was found or something like that. But overall, watching the news can be downright depressing. And you don't even have to look at the news to know that our human existence can be hard at times. Life is full of broken relationships, confusion, corruption, immorality. Little has changed in this regard since the time of Jesus. Then is now the world is for the most part a rather dark place. To understand our passage a little bit better, let's take a quick look at the historical background. In the original context, Jesus' self-reference to the light alludes to Israel's time in the wilderness during the Exodus. In the book of Exodus, it says in chapter 13, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. So we see that the light of God's presence shone by day and by night, so the Israelites could escape uh, their slave masters in Egypt. We also read in Exodus how God provided the manna, the bread from heaven, Exodus 16, and how he brought water out of a rock, Numbers 20. So by saying that he's the bread from heaven, the living water, and the light, Jesus claims to be God's ultimate life-giving provision for Israel. In fact, he's going even further. Not only is he the light of Israel, he is the light of the entire world. So it's against this wilderness backdrop that Jesus makes his astonishing claim of being the light of the world. Now, depending on where you come from, this can be either good news or bad news. Earlier in the Gospel, John wrote this very important earlier parallel passage in John 3, 19 to 21. And he says, The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and doesn't come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. 
According, According to Jesus, in the statement we read in John 8, 12, people in the world who live the way the world does walk in darkness. Let's unpack that a little bit. What does that mean? Well, what happens when you walk in darkness? Every so often, back at our house in North Carolina, I venture outside when it's already dark. Uh, put something in our crawl space or uh, back shed. Now, most of the time, I remember to turn out our outside lights on so I can see where I'm going, but sometimes I forget. When I do that, I often don't want to go back to turn on the light, but keep going anyway, uh, even though it's pitch dark outside, thinking I know the ter uh, terrain. Now, most of the time it works, but there are times when I forget I left something outside and I trip over it or uh, I, I step into a hole in, hole in the ground. Why? Because it's dark and I can't see where I'm going. All because I'm too lazy or too stubborn to go back and turn on the light so I can see. It's similar with people in the world. Jesus says that in truth, they don't see where they're going. They're morally and spiritually confused and without clear direction. As I was when I was lost in my sin before I met Christ. But even, but even though, though they walk, walk in darkness, darkness, people in the world are loving it. That's the paradox. They, they love the darkness. darkness. They'd rather stumble in the dark than come to the light. light. In, in fact, fact, Jesus puts, puts it even more strongly. He says they hate the light. Why? Because, because their works are evil, so they want to stay under the radar. radar. So, so what, what they go, what, what they do goes undetected. Does that sound, sound familiar? familiar? Uh, to any of you, that, that maybe, maybe characterize the life you live before coming to Christ? Or are there those here this morning who still live a secret life that they don't want to be exposed? I think we have to admit that Jesus offers a very keen description of our true spiritual condition that we would do well to face up to. We're sinners and we do wicked things and we desperately hope that our sin won't be exposed. And then on the other hand, there are those who follow Jesus, those who Jesus says have the light of life. Those people know where they're going. They have moral, moral and spiritual clarity regarding what's right and what's wrong. And they live life in the light of what Christ has revealed to them about God the Father and about himself. And they make small and big decisions based on what pleases God and brings him glory. Not, Not that they, they can do that in their own strength, strength. but they're, they're born, born again, they have experienced the spiritual rebirth, and they, they live life in the power of the Spirit as new creatures in Christ. Christ. So, so then what, what does it mean for you and for me that Jesus is the light of the world? I think essentially what it means is that Jesus shines his spotlight on our sinful condition so we can see ourselves in the light of his holiness and righteousness. I'm sorry to say, but I wonder if in God's eyes, we're kind of like rats in the dark who, when you suddenly turn on the light, scurry in every direction to run away from the light. I know that doesn't sound very nice or complimentary, but I think it's true. Now, the real question is, what do we do when Jesus shines his spotlight on our sin? Do we move toward him or away from him? Well, John tells us that Naturally, our sin nature causes us to hide from Jesus' presence, just as Adam and Eve did when they hid from God when they sinned in the garden. It's only by God's grace that any of us turns to Christ and comes to the light. John elsewhere says that God draws us, and that unless God draws people, no one can come to Jesus. So do you and I come to the light? Do we come to Jesus even in our sin and desperate condition? If you're not a believer yet, would you come to Jesus? He loves you and died for you. When people ask Jesus, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus replied, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. That you believe in him whom he has sent. All you need to do is repent and believe. Or if you're a Christian, when you sin, do you come to the light? 
You know, he wants you to come to him even, and I would even say especially when you sin, because he loves you and died for you so you can be forgiven. So do what doesn't come naturally and what may seem counterintuitive. Come to the light. Come to Jesus. He will receive you and forgive you. That's grace. All right, and before I close, I'd like to say a word about the Pharisees who, who serve as a sort of foil uh, in this passage, and I think we can even learn something from their uh, example. They exhibit a negative trait that John wants us as his readers to avoid, namely hardened skepticism, hardened skepticism. We've all known people, and maybe that's you today as you're sitting here in chapel, that were so dead set against the faith that no matter uh, what evidence you presented them with, uh, they'd already predetermined not to accept it. Of course, such an attitude is ultimately self-defeating because if you're already decided you're going to reject all evidence and all uh, answers, uh, how are you ever going to find out if something is true? I've written about this in some of my writings, especially Truth Matters uh, and Truth in the Culture of Doubt, and uh, given some interviews uh, to Apologetics White Web uh, Ministries that you can find on my website, biblicalfoundations.org, if you're interested, since we're so short on time here this morning. Uh, in short, it's one thing to be critical and ask someone for evidence to support their claim. It's another to be so skeptical that no evidence will ever convince you to let go of your negative bias and preconceived by, uh, ideas. So, so let's not be like, like the Pharisees. Pharisees. You, you can already see when you read uh, John chapter 8 that this conversation is going absolutely nowhere. Uh, because nothing Jesus can say will ever convince them that his claims are valid. But even though Jesus could be very frustrated with his opponents uh, and annoyed or even resent them, three times in our passage he warns them earnestly that unless they believe in him, they will die in their sins. Three times. I think that shows that he really cares. Um, he doesn't just try to give them a hard time or win an argument. Their eternal destiny is at stake. But what exactly does Jesus mean when he say, says people will die in their sins? It means they'll spend eternity in hell separated from God. Not, Not because, because God, God hasn't done everything he could to save them, but because they're unwilling to come to Jesus and admit their need for salvation. Don't be too proud to admit you need help. Uh, we all need help because we're frail, finite, and sinful people who need a Savior. Uh, we cannot save ourselves. But I don't want to close with a description of our sin. I want to end with a brief reflection on what, what this passage, and in fact, the entire Gospel of John, tells us about Jesus. Who is Jesus, according to John? John leaves no doubt whatsoever. Jesus is God. He is the Word made flesh. As John puts it, the only God who is at the Father's side. The union between Jesus and Yahweh, between God the Father and God the Son, is at the very heart of John's message. As Jesus says in John 10.30, I and the Father are one. In Jesus, the invisible God has become visible. Incredibly, Jesus says, when you look at Jesus, you see God. Jesus is the true and faithful representative of the Father who sent him. Now, I mentioned at the beginning that when Jesus said, I'm the light of the world, the Pharisees completely ignored him and at once went on to challenge his credibility. So rather than hear an elaboration of what it means for Jesus to be the light of the world, we read a heated discussion about who Jesus' father is and who their true spiritual father is. But you know what? Jesus is not to be ignored. So in the next chapter, in chapter 9, verse 5, Jesus says for a second time in John's Gospel, that he is the light of the world. And this time, he goes on to heal a man who was born blind in another amazing messianic sign. I've written more about this in my book, Signs of the Messiah. 
So Jesus has to lost the word. He doesn't just claim to be the light of the world. He acts as the Messiah. He makes the lame walk, chapter 5. He feeds the hungry, chapter 6. And he even gives sight to the blind in chapter 9. Jesus is the light of the world. So as I close, let's remember... John's purpose, the reason, uh, Jesus' purpose, the reason why he came was to show us how much God loves us and to save us by an act of supreme self-sacrifice. But in order to be saved, we must put our trust in Jesus. As Jesus says in our passage, unless you believe that I am, that I'm God, that I am the one I claim to be, the light of the world, the Savior, unless you believe in Jesus, you will die in your sins. Friends, the time to decide is now. You don't know if you're going to be alive tomorrow. So put your trust in Jesus today and decide to follow him. Or if you're his follower already, renew your commitment to Jesus this morning and follow him even more closely. Forsake all other loyalties and live only for him. He is so worthy. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for being here with us this morning through your spirit. Thank you for this precious time of worship and of reflecting on the meaning of your statement that you're the light of the world. Jesus, you are the light of the world. I praise and worship you this morning for opening the eyes of my heart to see you for who you truly are and putting my trust in you. I pray that if anyone here is sensing the Spirit pleading with him or her to put their trust in him, that they would not resist like the Pharisees did, but that they would be opening their hearts and allow you to come in. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing Psalm 117. Praise the Lord, all you nations, exalt him, exalt him.